Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator unmute there we go now you can hear me yes good morning how are you i'm fine thank you uh you know guys uh dr albrashi is no stranger to dental webinar series uh we're just going to go ahead and i i i i, I, I like to most of you have not met dr albrashi dr Brashi, we have a lot of uh, students from the middle east and uh and nigeria on here today lots of people from iraq from yemen from, uh, from, if you are from Egypt and you are on there, please let me know. <laughs> yeah, Egypt is very, um, it's one of my most favorite places uh, on, on, on earth to visit. I was at the Giza the other day. I'm like, wow, this is quite interesting. A lot of history, uh, you know, a lot of uh, stuff out there. Um, one, one minute, yes. No, I, I think you should just uh, go ahead. I mean, uh, guys, uh, uh, this is it. Uh, this is uh, the, 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 the next, uh, I don't want to, take any more time. I know we are two minutes to the hour here. And uh, Dr. Bashi, please go ahead. The floor is yours. So we're going to do questions as they come up or at the end? Uh, I, I think, um, yes, we'll do them towards the end. So uh, we just give you time to just go ahead. And about an hour, an hour and a quarter? Okay, that is fine. Okay. So guys, if you have any questions that is going on, just type it in the chat or use the Q&A section so that we can attend. To use the Q&A section so that it will be easy for him to just address your questions uh, at the end. All right, thank you, Uva. No problem. Good morning. Um, I am speaking to you from Portland, Oregon, which is uh, the state that's one, one state north of California. It's 7 a.m. here. I'm guessing it's 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., depending on which part of the world you're in. And um, as you can see from my last name, originally I'm Middle Eastern, I'm Arabic, I'm Egyptian proud of it. Um, I was raised in Egypt. My dad was a prosthodontist in Cairo. He trained at the University of Michigan, got his PhD there in 1969. And I have the fortune, I've had the fortune of, of practicing here uh, in this city for almost 20 years. I was in academia for a while. I also did my master's degree in Michigan. So it's an honor and a privilege to speak to you. A couple of disclosures. I'm not endorsing a particular technique or a philosophy. All my patients that I've treated uh, have consented to share their images. And please be aware, any, anybody who claims to be an expert, so-called expert, we're going to talk about expert opinion a little bit later, um, as I share some of my mistakes and some of the complications that we've had over the years. And we're trying to use an evidence-based approach whenever possible. So your decision-making process is quantitative and qualitative. What does that really mean? Well, quantitative analysis, you're comparing alternative treatments. So if a patient is missing, congenitally missing a lateral incisor, and he or she is 20 years old with virgin teeth, you're already in your mind going through various options subconsciously. Three-unit bridge, single implant, Maryland Bridge, partial denture, um, pros and cons of each. And that, that's a sub subconscious thing. The qualitative analysis takes into account our cognitive processes, the thoughts that we have, and the bias that the patient and you as a provider have to take that quantitative analysis or process into clinical action. So think of it as, as a sort of a, a red, a yellow, and a green light. Um, at what point do you go from stopping or, or no treatment 
to preparing for treatment, to actually moving forward with treatment. And what are the pros and cons of your treatment? And what's the biological cost for the patient in the long run? I'm not talking about the financial cost. In other words, if you do a three-unit bridge on virgin abutments, what is that going to look like 15, 20 years later? Are you going to have recession? Could you have caries? Could you end up with one of the abutments requiring endo and so on and so forth? And to that point, I want to share a case. This is Sally. Sally was referred to me from Washington State, a place called Walla Walla. And I treated her for 10, 12 years ago. And she came to me. She brought me this image. And this is a surgical stent that was fabricated by a periodontist who did a really, really nice job in terms of implant placement. And Sally was transitioning to being a dentalist in the maxilla and was really concerned about her ability to tolerate a maxillary complete denture. And so here she is with her upper complete denture, maxillary complete denture. You can see the plane of occlusion is not ideal. And we can see she has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten implants. So first molar, bicuspids, canine, central, canine, premolar, premolar, and more or less ideally placed for individual implants, one, two, three, three unit bridge or fixed partial denture, three unit bridge. Uh, uh, the issue is her lip support um, was very, very inadequate with the prosthesis out due to a lack of flange. And so you can see she has two locator abutments and the remaining healing abutments on them. And she hasn't had the case restored, nor is she going to. So from a surgical standpoint, this is, this is very nicely done treatment. The problem is there was no prosthetic or prosthodontic end anticipated or discussion with the patient prior to. So what could have been done different? Could this patient have had a complete denture prior to the implants being placed and see if she tolerated it? If we go back a slide, we can see we don't even have the black housings. So this is just a regular old denture, effectively resting either on root tips or abutments for support. We can see the plane of occlusion. The opposing arch is PFM, porcelain fused to metal. We can see here we've got significant wear. Porcelain against acrylic is an unfair thing. And this is the panorex. Obviously, that's some distortion there. And she comes to see me. She has a dry mouth. She's got caries and a failing mandibular dentition. So you need to decide on the treatment with the patient. And it depends on a range of factors. Some may be financial. Some may be based upon medical history. Some may be based upon patient anxiety, patient's previous experience, and the overall treatment complexity. And so if we go back here, she has a one splinted unit with a cantilever bridge. All of this is PFM and a cantilever back here with recurrent caries. I've removed the bridge. This is the canine. That's the lateral. That's the canine. Lower right premolars. In the States, we call these numbers 28 and 29. Failing bicuspid on the lower left. And obviously, the cantilever was there. And if you practice, and I was still doing a lot of, I don't want to call it heroic dentistry, but um, by the time I removed the previous bridge, removed the caries, that's what the preps look like. This tooth is non-restorable. You can see the canine here doesn't look in great shape. And this is the pre-op, and we elected to extract this tooth, place two implants, and do a splinted two-unit implant bridge. In the anterior mandible, we elected to do a cement-retained fixed partial denture 22 through 27. So canine to canine, electing not to extract number 26. And of course, my concern is that 26 is a brittle or a fragile abutment, and that could fracture. So here she is. One unit, one unit, one unit. She ended up fracturing the canine with a periapical lesion. So now we have an abutment here, a lateral, and a fractured canine. And I elected at this point, placing another implant, just a single implant in the canine, I thought was poor treatment, because if this failed or that failed, 
And I thought that was going to potentially going to happen. And at this point, she's living in Palm Springs, which is, um, you know, a thousand miles away. She has the, te the teeth extracted, two implants placed there, little more corona of light. She comes back to see me. I've taken an impression. And here is uh, the glazed, sorry, the bisque stage where we're trying in the bridge. And we can see we've had some recession. Both of these, a narrow connection, uh, NC Strauman. 3.3 millimeter diameter, cement retained due to the position of the implants. Could not not do uh, screw retained at this point and wasn't adequate space vertically for a multi-unit abutment and there was no angled screw channel at that point. And here is trying in the bridge. We can see we've had some recession and what's that going to look like in the future and so on, but an acceptable result for her. So now we have screw retained splintered, six units anterior, Recurrent caries again due to the extreme dry mouth and a previous fail, a history of endo. Those bicuspids failed. So now the, these have failed. We've extracted those two teeth. We have regular connection, the RC uh, 4.1 millimeter diameter Strauman implant. And that's now been restored also screw retained. So you can see this became a six implant mandibular prosthetic. And Candidly, I thought it was naive, uh, was what I call ad hoc reactive. As a tooth fails, I replace it. Today, I would have treated this patient different. I would have, we would have extracted all the teeth, placed four implants at the same time, and provided the patient with a provisional fixed prosthesis. Implants probably would have been second bicuspid, lateral, lateral, second bicuspid, probably with first molar, um, cantilever and potentially acrylic teeth due to the fact that the opposing denture is still acrylic and has not been uh, remade. So we rely upon clinical experience and clinical experience is defined as thus making the same mistakes over and over with increasing self-confidence. And at that point in my career, I was gung-ho about saving compromised teeth and you can see the net result. Let's look a little bit at what evidence-based dentistry is defined as, defined by the American Dental Association as an approach to healthcare requiring integration of systematic reviews, of clinically relevant evidence relating to the patient's oral and medical condition and history with your clinical expertise and the patient's needs and preferences. We all have clinical expertise. What is the patient's need and what preferences do they have? And are they confused? Do they understand the shortcomings of something that's fixed and the pros and cons of something that's removable and so on? And, and let's remember, this is not an exact science because there's a subjective idea about how a removable prosthesis is going to fit. So let's imagine a patient has an interim partial denture replacing laterals and centrals in the maxilla and the patient cannot stand that type of prosthesis at all. That's obviously a poor candidate for a permanent removable partial denture or a poor candidate for a maxillary complete denture. However, if the patient is doing very well with the partial denture and they start to lose other teeth um, and you decide to make a, a uh, cobalt chrome based maxillary partial denture with a lingual plate. So as you lose more teeth, you can add them on there and the patient seems to be adapting very well. That patient is a good candidate for a maxillary complete denture due to two reasons. Firstly, as, as they lose more abutments and the partial denture more or less grows, in other words, as you're adding more prosthetic teeth on that, it's becoming more and more like a tissue borne prosthesis. And if they've adapted well, then that patient may be a good candidate especially if anatomically they have um, appropriate tissues to tolerate maxillary denture. So here is another patient that was at the university, 30 year smoker, crown and bridge in the mandible, had a bilateral sinus lift and was treated by a couple of oral surgeons there where I made a, a, a diagnostic setup, duplicated it in acrylic and requested a six implants, 
for a maxillary overdenture, or potentially the patient was uncertain she was going to go with something removable, um, still potentially use the six implants and splint them to fabricate a fixed prosthesis. The issue is the implant positioning, the height of the implants, and we're going to see that shortly. The vertical space that I have, it looks plenty here. In reality, it isn't. And the, the panoramic x-ray is a little uh, misleading. This is not in the floor of the nose. And my concern at that time, those were uh, replace, select, narrow platform, 3.5 millimeters. And I'd never restored an arch with narrow platform implants. I'd been out of my residency about three or four years. This implant here failed. So I have three good ones on the, on the right, something in the central, something in the second by, and nothing in between. And so I was concerned, I referred the patient back and to my shock, she came back with another three implants. So she went from five to eight, which may seem okay, but really we don't need eight, especially in light of the fact she doesn't have a mandibular partial and she's missing teeth over here. Now you have a look at the positioning of these. This one's okay. That one may be a little bit facial. That one's facial. That one's definitely quite facial. That one could come a little bit more lingual. That one's facial. That one's no good. And this one's okay. So sort of here, there, and everywhere. And when we go back and take our impressions and uh, have a look at the emergence profile of where the uh, implants are placed, that's how we're going to be emerging. So either you're going to be doing composite or you're going to need to use a multi-unit abutment to correct that angulation because right now this is zero degree or following the implant axis. So if you switch that to a 17 degree, then potentially you can compensate for this, for that, for that. And this one seems to be okay. When we look at the occlusal surface, this one is in a good position. That one's in a good position. That one's okay. And that one's okay. The right side are all off. So left side's okay. Right side, which we initially thought was fine, really is not. And the problem is the amount of vertical room we have. So this is, shows you how old the case is because we used to have to make GC pattern resins for the CAD CAM framework. And then this would be copy mill. So this is a, a 2005, 2004 case. And I'm trying in this pattern in the mouth. And of course I've tried in the teeth. Now I'm looking at the proposed titanium frame relative to the prosthesis, and I simply don't have enough room. So we can see we're very tight against the teeth. There's minimal retention on the framework. If we think of our, of our cobalt chrome partial denture uh, frameworks, you can go ahead and cast those with individual diatoric support for each tooth because we're gonna have acrylic bonded to titanium. Here is the prosthesis. You can see how much I've had to adjust because of the opposing plane of occlusion on the right side. Again, acrylic against um, PFM really is quite a poor choice of materials, but I had no other choice at this point. And here she is aesthetically happy, functionally not very happy because the teeth wore out and had to be replaced and so on. Here she is 10 years post-op. You can see I've used uh, composites. One, two, three, four, five, six, and decided not to load this. And I really tried to convince her to do a single implant in the molar and another implant here, but she'd had such a poor experience with the maxilla that she absolutely decided not to do it. So the problem becomes most of her chewing is on the right side. We're gonna have significantly more wear. And if I have to redo this case, which I didn't because she decided to go see somebody else, uh, I would remake this prosthesis now either in PFM or monolithic zirconia, knowing that this is still uh, felspathic porcelain. So who ultimately decides on the treatment and who bears the responsibility for the outcome? Well, who bears the responsibility? It's you as the, as the restorative dentist. It's you if you're the surgeon. If you've done the surgery and the restorative, well, absolutely you're responsible. Uh, the technician has a big part to play in it, but by the time the case gets to the technician, he or she is, is, is more or less playing catch up. So 
I guess what I'm trying to tell you is appropriate diagnostics prior to the surgery are important. Make sure the surgeon uses the surgical guide, understands what the game plan is, because this case, if we had used crown and bridge, we could have compensated and done PFM. The issue is all the missing soft tissue. And how are you going to make this uh, in any shape or form cleansable? And if you go ahead and cement and a patient has a porcelain fracture, what are you going to, how, how are you going to fix that? Could you do this as one segment? This, this is a segment. That is a segment. Yes, you could. But in terms of retrievability, that's very challenging. She really needed what implants there. So this was a paper that was published, and, and it's a little bit facetious, but, but I think you'll understand the sentiment. It's published in 1992. Prestigious surgeon visited a medical school and presented on patients who had undergone vascular reconstruction. At the end of the lecture, a young student at the back of the room timidly asked him, did you have any controls? The doctor drew himself up to his height, hit the desk and said, do you mean I only operated on 50% of the patients? The hall grew very quiet. The voice at the back of the room hesitantly replied, yes, that's what I had in mind. The visitor's fist came down and said, of course not. That would have doomed half of them to their death. Silence ensued and one could scarcely hear the small voice ask which half. So think about what your control group looks like or if you're looking at cohorts in a study, treatment versus no treatment. Because sometimes the treatment of the patient comes with a biological cost and it may not be favorable. So we, we often think that all patients need to have complex treatment. In reality, they don't. And so let's transition a little bit to the edentulous patients and where they are in the world and so on. And so if you look at the advanced world or so-called advanced world, Canada, USA, Switzerland, their edentulism rate, 20 percentile, 20 percentile. Brazil, 55%. This is an anomaly due to the civil war. India, imp impressive at 16%. China at 9%, I was surprised. And Russia at 18%. It'd be interesting to see what the rate of edentulism is in Yemen, in Baghdad, in Cairo, in Lagos. And of course, it's going to depend upon many, many factors. So if you have an MBA from the University of Paris, you're not likely to be edentious. But if you are illiterate and you live in the countryside and you've worked on the fields your whole life, you have a higher chance of being edentious. And it's not related to occupation, it's related to access to care and education and so on. And so when we look at what's happening in the US, the projections of edentialism after five decades of decline, complete tooth loss is considered the dental equivalent of mortality. Edentialism represents the end stages of dental caries and periodontitis. Some studies have found there's a correlation between edentialism and mortality. The edentialism rate or percentage declined from 19% in 1957 to 5% in 2012 in the US. There's an inverse relationship between education and edentialism prevalence. We know that. The census data, the total adult population in the US is going to go to about 245 million. The baby boomers, and we're gonna talk about this generation Adults aged 55 to 74, they're increasing. Adults aged 75 and above will increase from 13 million to 22 million in this country. How does that look like in your country? Are we having a bigger, a, a significantly higher percentage of people living into old age and how are we managing those patients? And of course, in the Middle East and Africa, as patients get older, they tend to still live with their family. So they're taken care of by their family. In this country and the, the, the Western world, they tend to go to nursing homes where perhaps the level of care is, is more efficient, but less personal. And so when we look at a patient who's transitioning to becoming a dentalist, this, this is Greta. Greta was a, a patient at the dental school. I'm going to talk about her in a minute. The edentialism rate decreased 10% every 10 years. 
and with increasing life expectancy, every year life expectancy is growing except 2020, and we know why. The percentage of patients over the age of 65 increased by 73%, according to the American Medical Association. An adult population needing one or two complete dentures in this country is roughly 40 million adults, and the total number of redentulous arches is such. Life expectancy here was 79 years old in 2015. Now, depending on where you live, life expectancy is going to vary. And so the, the, the so-called baby boomers, baby boomers are people born after World War II from 1946 to 1964, when there was a temporary boom in birth rate in the US. They matured at a time of increasing affluence and expected a better quality of life. So these folks typically are well-educated, they have money, and they're rejecting the fact that they're becoming indentures. I'm actually going to skip these because they're a little bit complicated. Let's look at this one. This looks at prevalence of redentialism in the US according to gender and age. We can see that a young group, very, very few people are redentialists. As we become older, that number increases. At the age of 75, it's about the same. According to race, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. That's nothing to do with ethnicity. It's more or less to do with demographic, demographics. Income absolutely has something to do with it. Like I said, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to be a dentalist because when you go to the dentist, if you go, it's more or less emergency care for extractions. So we can see there's a pattern here. If you make more than $75,000 a year, you have access to care and they tend to be the lowest rate of edentialism, and education. If you finished high school and beyond, again, it's related to that. And we can see certain trends like we talked about. When we look at the prevalence of permanent tooth retention, hanging on to teeth by age, sex, and race, 2011, 2012, we can see in the cohort 20 to 39 years old, 66.7% had their teeth. And as they got older and the 40 and above, it came down. Men versus women, not much difference. African-American or black uh, population had the lowest rate of tooth retention. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. That, of course, makes sense because now we're looking at edentialism. So when a patient is in the 65 to 74% 74 year age group, 13% were edentulous. And then once they get to 75 and above, it doubles. Men versus women, again, the same. Non Hispanic black, 30% or, or close to it were edentulous. Non Hispanic Asian were lower. So, on average, 4 million adults reach their 60th birthday in this country. That's 100 people every 13 minutes, every hour of every day. What does that look like in your country? And it, for example, I know in, in, in the Middle East, a significant percentage of the population is, is below the age of 30 or 40. So I don't think this necessarily equates to over there, but people are living to be older. It's the wealthiest and best educated generation known reckoning with their mortality and asking questions about life's meanings and their quality of life. This is a very important thing to remember. What does their quality of life look like and what will they accept and reject? What does this mean for them as people and for you as their dentist? Are traditional complete dentures adequate for our patients moving forward? It's a facetious question because it depends on the patient. Here is a patient. He was an engineer in the army, and he's on his way to being a dentalist, partially dentate in the maxilla, partially dentate in the mandible, only has six or seven teeth at contact. And initially, we did a lower all on four for him and a maxilla complete denture. Within a month or two, he came back and said, I can't tolerate the upper prosthesis. So think about the treatments that you provide 
the complexity of the treatment and how that allows you to get your patient where they need to be from a functional standpoint. And this is a facetious uh, slide. It's George Burns, who was a comedian. If you live to be 100, you've got it made. Very few people die past that age. So let's talk about shared decision-making. This was an editorial in the International Journal of Pros last year by uh, Alina Saylor. Shared decision-making involves the patient and the clinician in the treatment decision-making process. Patients must clearly understand treatment options, pros and cons of treatment versus no treatment, and associated risks involved. And you may use an analog, like a wax-up, or a digital mock-up. But patients need to understand what's happening. And depending on where you are in the world, so for example, Egypt is still a patriarchal society. My father was a dentist. My grandfather was a dentist. As a doctor there, you walk in with a white coat. The patient very much respects you. They ask you what the, you should have, what they should have. You tell them, and most of the time they agree. The problem is now patients have access to the internet. They're reading. They're getting second, third, fourth, fifth opinions, and they're coming in, and they don't necessarily have confidence in the proposed treatment plan. So what we need to have is what we call a biopsychosocial treatment plan which is, sounds complicated, but really what it means is understand your patient biology, their psychological needs, and the social impact of the disease on them. Put yourself in your patient's shoes and understand what it is, or as my father used to say, meet your patient's mind before you meet your patient's mouth. Try to understand what it is about the patient. Is it they want to be able to eat meat? They want to chew hard things? They want teeth that they can take out or they want something that is not removable. Really get, try and get a good understanding prior to treatment. This is Barbara. You can see the condition of her teeth before and after. So th th these treatments can be life-changing for patients. You need to have a comprehensive examination with current physical, psychological, and behavioral patient information. If this patient is smoking two packs of cigarettes a day as a, under the treatment of a shrink, or a psychiatrist, is she a good candidate for implants? Probably not. What risk factors does he or she present with and how can you modify them to improve the likelihood of success? If you have a patient whose A1C is 10, or like we have in the Middle East where people have a cup of tea this big and about six spoons of sugar in it, what are the, what's their sugars look like when they're measuring daily if they measure? What are the treatment alternatives? What's the risk benefit to doing treatment or not? This patient we treated with an upper and lower all on four. Unfortunately, when we came to place some of the maxillary implants, they had no talk. So in the mandible, we took out the teeth, we placed implants. We knew we were going to be able to load. In the maxilla, we anticipated that we were going to have poor talk posteriorly. We took out posterior teeth knowing that we were going to have poor talk. We placed the two distal implants and I had an interim partial denture ready to go. Much better treatment than taking everything out and saying to the patient, your bone was soft. And here she is at the end of treatment. It did complicate treatment. It took a long time, but it was better treatment. And some patients, it's all about function. And for some patients, it's aesthetics. Most of us, it's a combination of, of all of the above. I want to be able to eat. I don't want to remove my teeth. I don't want to feel embarrassed. Um, I want to be able to smile when I get pictures taken with my kids and so on. And so you want to use a patient-centered treatment philosophy. It's a young gal from Hong Kong. She had an eating disorder. Had ortho at one point. You can see she's had some relapse. And significant erosion on the lingual of these teeth. Obviously, she's a class 2 patient. And she said to me, I, I don't want you to change my appearance too much. I like my two front teeth and the position of them. But you can see when we're doing the wax trying, We've modified things, but still giving her a, a smile. Even though it's gummy, she's very happy with the appearance. And so most of the time, these, my presentations or, or my patient population, they're older patients. And what are the challenges associated with dealing with older patients? They're not simply older adults. It's a mixed group that vary widely in their physiologic and psychosocial characteristics and in the number and severity of diseases that they suffer from. 
So this is Pat. Pat had a maxillary complete denture and a lower all on three. And here's the new prosthetic that I've made her. And I said, these teeth look, they look too toothy for you. She said, you're right. When I look back at my old pictures, I didn't show that much tooth. So I've made her something more discreet. And this is Inga. Inga is German. You can see she's got a crossbite on the left side and a high smile line with significant recession. And post-op, we still retained somewhat of that characteristic appearance. As we know, a certain percentage of the population is more than 65 years old. And when you look at your patients, you can classify them into young old, 65 to 74, that's 7%, old, 75 to 84, and then old, old, which is 85 and above. And they're very challenging, not because of who they are as people, because of their multimorbidities. And we're going to talk about that shortly. Also, 20% of community dwelling older patients have some kind of psychiatric disorder. I'm not talking about bipolar disorder. I'm talking about something like cognitive decline, Parkinson's, um, and so on. 28% of older patients have three or more chronic diseases. And so what stops patients from seeking treatment? And this was published in International Journal of Cross in 2007. Need becoming demand and demand becoming usage. What is the gatekeeper for this patient from having the treatment? He's been in a maxillary complete denture since about 1950 and a mandibular complete denture for a long, long time too. We can see we've got posterior atrophy and his concern and his wife's concern who had power of attorney was a mandibular fracture. He also had some Parkinson's. So what is a subjective plan versus the objective facts that you see? And are mandibular overdentures appropriate? Absolutely. If you have an edentulous patient who's struggling with retention of the mandibular prosthesis, who's able to tolerate a mandibular prosthesis, two anterior implants will help. But they're not going to eliminate the problems that you have with a removable prosthetic. So please don't think you can fabricate a prosthesis without adequate extensions just because you have anterior implants, because essentially what you've done, is you set yourself up with a fulcrum. And so the principles for elder patients, you would want something that's easy to insert and remove, if it's removable, easy to clean, smooth polished surfaces so you don't have too much surface detail for plaque accumulation, freedom in centric occlusion, shallow cusp inclines, less than 20 degrees to allow patients to sort of wander, and an age adequate dental appearance. This is the same patient, this is Leroy from before, you can see when we're planning his, his mandibular prosthesis is quite complex. And so the, here is the planning or the imaging. This is where we're planning to place the three implants. Very complicated because in terms of these patients, they have shallow vestibules. Typically, the genial tubercles on the lingual have migrated superiorly. They really don't have a posterior vestibule. And you, you're going to need a long cantilever due to the position of the mental foramen and how far anterior the nerve has come. And so this is my old friend, Herb Goodman. He's no longer around, but this is the fellow that I bought my practice from. These are the things that you need to, to look at. Polypharmacy, how many medications are they taking? How many diseases do they have? Multimorbidity. Logistically, how are they doing and how mobile are they? And who's taking them and bringing them to the appointments? Anatomically, what are we looking at in terms of dental implants if we're doing implants? Mentally, how is he doing? Physically, is he, is he capable of coping with the procedure or not? Do you need to keep it conservative and stage treatment? Socioeconomically, how is this patient? And what kind of physical and mental reserves do they have? And is your treatment going to accelerate the aging process in a frail patient and, and become a burden for them? So there's a nice acronym here. It's, it's OSCAR. You're looking at the oral factors the systemic factors, the capability of the patient to withstand the treatment, the autonomy of the patient, and the reality. This is my daughter, Sophia. And so when we look at Herb, Herb 
is a dentist or was a dentist and he's clearly had access to all sorts of dental treatment. Short implant here, failing second molar there, endo-treated molar, Maryland bridge, endo, 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 fractured bicuspid, fractured lateral, dry mouth, high caries rate, prostate cancer, leukemia, atrial fib, and a prosthetic heart valve. So a complicated patient. In this instance, we decided to take out the bicuspids and the lateral, tilt an implant here, and use the distal implant and this implant in the canine to do a cantilever PFM bridge. So I had to use a multi-unit abutment, and here is the bridge that screw retained. This tooth failed. He wasn't a candidate for a sinus lift. We elected to use the old implant in the second premolar position to do a cantilever. Extracted number 15 due to the infection. Tried to convince him to extract this. He said no. And then he had number 10, the upper left lateral fail. And that one we restored with an immediate implant. Not a candidate for dental implants due to the positioning of the incisors and the mobility. And so this Maryland bridge came off a couple of times and I just re-cemented it. He passed at the age of 94 and I think this was good treatment. Complicated treatment, but good treatment for him. Now let's talk about autonomy and think of this concept, please. What is the patient biologically? What is their age versus their, their given or their chronological age? So not all 70-year-old patients are the same. This is Jay. Jay is also passed. Jay initially came to see me with multiple fractured teeth and decided that he wanted to do implant bridges. He said, I don't want a bulky prosthetic. And so we, we started to take out teeth and graft and fit an interim partial denture. And we were going to do a three-unit bridge here and then a bridge on the left side and leave this alone. He didn't want to have that tooth taken out. The problem is Jay had a stroke. And so patients need to have self-determination for their treatment. They must comprehend and reason the pros and cons of treatment versus no treatment. Informed consent requires full disclosure of risks and benefits. And the evaluation for capacity to consent is complex and is evaluated each step. We never finished treatment for him. So he had submerged implants and an interim partial and would not consent to have those implants uncovered because he didn't comprehend what was happening and so on. Quite tragic, really. And older patients will often seek treatment elsewhere, and you're left fixing this type of mess. So this patient went and had treatment in South America. This is John. I don't know John's exact age, but, but he's an older guy. He's retired. I think he's in his 80s. You can see he's got a mishmash, failing implant, a couple of crowns that have come off, fractured teeth and just very complicated. I don't speak Spanish. I didn't understand what these, what implant system this was and so on. So there's one implant that I recognize and that's a tissue level um, NC Strauman in number 10. In this instance, we decided to take everything up. We placed four implants and started from, from scratch. You can see it's just a mishmash. So trying to work with these old crowns and abutments and so on can be complicated. It's not say it's not doable. The problem is this implant is failing. These are temporary crowns. Here is, this is part of a bridge. This implant's in good shape. This is a tooth with caries. Missing tooth. Here is the implant in number 13 and then number 14's got to go. And again, he just elected to remove, clean up, place new implants, knowing that I don't have to deal with complications from previous implants and infection and so on. And you may say, well, that's aggressive treatment. And I might agree with you, but at least proactively the patient knows, and he lives 300 miles away from me, that there's going to be no problems with, with prosthetic parts and so on. Or if there are, I can fix it. So it's complex and subjective treatment planning with the patient. Patients have an ability, or all of us have something called neuroplasticity or brain plasticity. It's basically learning new uh, things and adapting to treatments. Um, there's also a use it or, or lose it 
principle where we have atrophy. And if, if, if a patient is edentulous for a long time, you can see deprivation of one sensory input may cause its corresponding cortical area to be at least partially taken over by adjacent cortical areas. The skills you don't practice get weaker. And so from a muscle tone standpoint, that happens as it does to the bone. When we look at this patient who's been edentulous for a very long time, you can see his master muscles are atro atrophied. And patients will have um, their motor fibers as they get older will disappear. And then those muscle fibers are adopted by neighboring motor units. And that's why you will see sort of scratchy handwriting from an elderly patient. And the reason I'm showing you Ferris is that Ferris had three implants placed in the mandible. I presumed he was going to be able to tolerate something fixed. He couldn't. So even after we placed the implants, made him a provisional fixed prosthesis, when it came time to make the final prosthesis, he elected to have a tissue and implant born prosthetic. So here is the implant. There is another implant. There's the third implant. We have two locators, and this is a fixed detachable prosthesis. As we get older, we will go through certain changes. And with women, it's menopause. They're going to have decreased estrogen levels. And you get a discrepancy between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. You get a slower healing process and a longer healing time. And when a patient's been edentious for a very long time, they're going to have extreme atrophy. This patient is not a candidate for dental implants without some kind of onlay grafting due to the high likelihood of fracture. And so one of your pr principles is non-maleficence or do no harm. The other principle you have is beneficence, which is acting in the patient's best interest. So again, another high risk patient, a fracture. So I told this patient, I said, if you are my mom, we would do bilateral sinus lift and implants in the maxilla. In the mandible, you need to have some kind of onlay graft. So, well, where do they get the bone? I said, either your hip or your rib or something. But you're not a candidate for placing implants as is due to the potential for fracture. And some of these patients are very diligent. This is one of my patients. She brings a dental mirror and a magnifying glass, and she doesn't like the fact that you can see the wall of number 13 implant, you can see the abutment exposed. So 8.3% of all patients and 36% of patients with multimorbidities had both a physical and mental health disorder. This patient had obsessive compulsive disorder. Physical and mental comorbidity, health comorbidity was higher in females than males and significantly higher in older patients than younger patients. When we have a look at implant success rates in older patients compared to younger patients, surprisingly, there's very little difference. And the reason is bone is bone. It heals. Patients themselves may be more fragile, but there's not a significant difference in between implant success rates in an older cohort compared to a cohort. And as we can see with older bone, you're getting thinning trabeculae in the bone more trabecular spaces, which means there's more brittleness and a higher incidence of microfracture. Anxiety also has something to do with implant treatment. So this paper was published and they looked at patients and they looked Hi, Dr. Abrashi. I can't, I think your microphone went off. It's mute. Better? Yeah, back on, yeah. Okay. Um, and let's talk about what stops patients from moving forward with treatment. This is a paper published in 2005. Your, Canada. your screen is not being shared as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. Share screen. How about now? Yes, good. Okay. So 101 volunteers with new upper and lower dentures 
answered questions about oral health related quality of life, background, satisfaction with the dentures and a preference for implants. And they were offered implants at no cost. One or two implants at no cost. It's mandibular implants for an overdenture. Just for, for the sake of the argument, ignore the fact that it's one implant. We'll call it two implants because it's both, both were for an overdenture. 64% wanted implants and 36% did not. And the reason was most of them wanted improved lower complete denture stability. The most common reason for refusal of implants was fear of surgery. Patients are fearful. And it makes sense because they don't know. And so when you have a patient with significant atrophy like this, you need to help them understand that really they're not a great candidate for surgery. Because if you place mandibular implants here, you've got a high chance of fracture. But some of these patients have been edentulous for a very long time. This is Ida. Ida has the classic edentulous profile, especially with the prostheses out. We can see the lower facial third is collapsed, vertical dimensions inadequate. She's got a typical edentulous profile and so on. And then here she is. In terms of us looking at the CT scan, she does have some mandibular bone anteriorly to allow us to place three implants in what we call the V3 position with minimal risk of fracture, but with a long cantilever. And the reason that I've gone for a long cantilever is the opposing arch is the maxillary complete denture. And you can see from her facial profile, this patient does not look like she's about to fracture this prosthetic. So this group of patients, when they've been a dentist for a very long time, and they simply cannot tolerate a mandibular denture because of the denture, uh, that the soft tissues really allow very poor retention and stability of the prosthetic, the implants can make a huge difference. Whether it's fixed or removable doesn't make a difference really. It, it will help the patient be able to retain the prosthesis. But our primary goal is to do no harm, as we know. And the problem is sometimes we push the envelope and this is a case that was treated in St. Louis. And this is a patient who was on bisphosphonates and <clears throat> they stopped taking the oral medications a while before, history of smoking, diabetes, and so on. She ended up with a mandibular fracture. So, you know, there's, there's often, you can see he's placed a short implant back here because of where the nerve was, but she had non union and fracture here. Complicated. At this point, that becomes a mess to, to, to take care of. So, you have to do a risk benefit analysis, and I would rather work with a cautious surgeon, and, and for the record, I don't place any implants. My partner is an oral surgeon, Jeff Burstein. He's an MD, he's a DDS, mm -hmm. and I leave all of the tricky stuff to him because, candidly, I, uh, these cases are very, very complicated, and I rely on his judgment and his skill uh, prior to me restoring these. This is a typical patient that I see. I mean, look at this. This is on the day of surgery. She has dry mouth hypothyroid, hyperparathyroid, high cholesterol, hypertensive, stage three kidney disease, gouty arthropathy, arthritis, tinnitus, hearing loss, constipation, back or neck pain, headaches, lymphadenopathy, anxiety and depression, insomnia, GERD, hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis, occasional alcohol, irritable bowel syndrome, history of cancer. These are the medications she takes, levothyroxine, gabapentin, levothyroid, Statin, Miralax, Amlodipine, Lisinopril, Aspirin, Omega, fish oil, calcium, so on and so forth. And so multimorbidity is something that we need to look at, especially if, if you're working in, a, in a, an advanced or a, a large urban area, because lots of patients are going to have several medical conditions, then they're going to be taking more than one medication. So multimorbidity is coexistence of two or more chronic health conditions with an adverse impact on health status and function requiring complex management or decision-making. It's associated with polypharmacy, lots of medications, adverse drug events, increased emergency room visits. Patients are less able to stress, have a reduced physiological reserve, poor patient quality of life, maybe some psychological issues and increased mor morbidity and mortality. Fragmented advice. They're not getting a consensus. Higher rates of medical errors since specialists tend to 
focus on managing just the one disease, their particular issue. Polypharmacy are multiple medications taken by a patient, including over-the-counter medications and herbal remedies and dietary supplements. Of course, we know in the Middle East, we have non-traditional uh, uh, medications that are taken, um, herbal medications and so on, um, that, that can also affect bleeding times and healing and, and so on and so forth. So these multiple chronic conditions allow, or the patient has an increased medication list. We have complex interaction between the medications, adverse drug events, decline of the patient due to the adverse drug events, which may be subtle, further chronic conditions, and what I call a prescribing cascade. Round and round we go especially in this country where many, many patients take more medications than they know of and they don't even know why they're taking them. So 75 to 85-year-old patients in the U.S., 36% take five or more medications, 50% take over-the-counter medications. There's a higher risk of adverse drug event due to age-related physiological changes. We know that. The body's ability to metabolize the drugs, either the liver function or the kidney function and higher risk patients due to inappropriate prescribing, reactions from over-the-counter drugs, and poor patient compliance. And when I say reactions from over-the-counter drugs or herbal supplements, we had a patient who was eating a lot of ginseng and garlic and ginkgo and so on. And when we took out the teeth, his bleeding, we, we couldn't even play some parts. We just took out teeth and used electrocautery and sutured. So some of these food uh, or herbal supplements will affect your surgical management. 15 to 40% of older patients develop a moderate to severe amnesia from medication use. And this is another patient we just treated. She has sinus problems, arthritis, hypertension, anemia, fibromyalgia, anxiety, psychiatric care, chronic fatigue, smokes marijuana socially, alcohol, bleeds easily, has a pain contract, as migraine cysts on the lungs, takes Prozac, Percocet, and 81 milligrams of aspirin, Imitrex for the migraines, and an iron supplement. And so on the day of surgery, our reminders are the following. Stop your ibuprofen or aspirin two weeks prior to. Stop smoking or drinking marijuana two weeks prior to. Stop vitamin supplements um, or the ginkgos, gin, gingers, ginsengs two weeks prior to. Wear any removal prosthesis as little as possible two weeks prior to. Start brushing the tissues with Peridex two weeks prior to. Stop your ADHD medication the day prior and the day of surgery. The anesthesiologist is going to call you the night prior to. Bring your inhaler and your CPAP. Take or bring normal medications for blood pressure or pain medication. Hold the meds or the AM dose of the diabetes medication, and so on and so forth. So very complicated. You need to have a very good understanding of how to manage these patients. Most of the patients that we treat for complex surgery are treated with IV sedation with a CRNA, a nurse anesthetist there. We know that a patient's taken certain classes of medications now are, are related to a higher uh, than the normal or higher than expected implant failure rate. So patients taking selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors such as citalopram it's associated with a higher implant failure rate based on two retrospective studies, 790 patients. The implant failure rate was higher in patients taking these types of medications versus the control group with an odds ratio of about 3%, about 3x. Patients on proton pump inhibitors, such as Omprezol, uh, are associated with a statistically significant increase in implant failure rate. Two studies, almost 1,800 patients, an implant failure rate was higher in patients with the proton pump inhibitors versus the control group with an odds ratio uh, of two. So the medications themselves may be associated with higher failure rates due to the effect on the bone turnover and calcium absorption with the PPIs. And this is a paper that was published in 2018, the effect of advanced age or systemic medical conditions on dental implant survival. The most common chronic conditions in elders, according to the, the WHO, were cardiovascular disease, hypertensive disease, cancer, 
respiratory diseases, COPD and asthma and so on, diabetes mellitus, cirrhosis, osteoarthritis, and neurocognitive impairments such as depression and Alzheimer's. Common uh, chronic diseases, male compared to female, hypertension, it's about the same, men compared to women, dementia, more or less the same, depression, about the same, arthritis, women were a little bit higher, diabetes is higher in men compared to women, not surprised there, reflux was about the same, atherosclerosis, cardiac insufficiency, cerebral vascular disease, and anemia. So not much difference according to gender, which is what we expect. And when we have a look at implant failure rates, so this is uh, randomized clinical trials on dental implant therapy in elder patients 75 and above. So here is the mean age of the patients. There is the implant system. There is the year loading protocol and so on. And age group 83 for women, 84 for men and so on and so forth. We have a look at implant survival rate. There's not a significant difference or correlation between age and implant failure per se. But the diseases themselves and their treatment may be a risk to the patient, and those risks can be absolute or relative. Risks could be due to the surgical procedure, initial osseointegration, a soft tissue response, or long-term implant survival. Polypharmacy can complicate healing and long-term osseointegration. The pathways of failure could be direct or indirect. And patients with reduced motor skills like rheumatoid arthritis or stroke or patients with dementia or depression who are poorly motivated, you can have significant complications. So when your patient comes back at three months and they look like this, you've got a problem. This is a patient we did not treat. She was on methotrexate, heavy smoker, and came to see us with these implants looking like this after she'd had extraction bone grafting, implants submerged healing, and then when the implants were, were uncovered, they did some soft tissue grafting. And this is what she looked like five years later. This review did not reveal age as a risk factor, but they did talk about something called immunosenescence, which is the thing of the immune system. It can compromise the body's defense mechanisms, and as the human immune system declines in effectiveness with age, this could be achieved for functionally impaired older adults if oral hygiene is neglected. This is a patient who was hit by a car years ago and had very poor clarity. And this is what his implants look like about six years after an oral fall because of the poor dexterity. What about patients with Sjogren's syndrome? Or medication-induced dry mouth, or a history of radiotherapy. This is a patient, how she presented. She'd had all these crowns done in my private practice by my predecessor. She showed up at the center where I work now. She said, I'm really frustrated with the, with the amount of fillings I'm getting done over and over again. I'm just done. And it was, it was a tough one because I said to her, I said, you know, Charlie, you have good bone. You don't have periodontal disease. She said, yes, but every three months I'm coming back and somebody's telling me you've got another cavity, you've got another cavity. So when you have a patient with extreme dry mouth, high motivation, low sugar intake, and a fluoride tray, and this is what they're presenting, either the previous work is poorly done or the patient is simply incapable of maintaining. And that's when you have to make a, a sort of a drastic decision. Is it time to take out the teeth and place implants and so on? And that's, a, again, another subjective decision. And she asked me, said, at what point do you accept that your treatment has not worked for patients like me? She was a nurse. It was an interesting question. So now let's look at multimorbidity and implications in healthcare, what we call a cross-sectional study. This, this came from The Lancet. This looked at, at almost 2 million patients in medical practices in Scotland. And the conclusion was, or well, their interpretation was, the findings challenged the single disease framework by which most healthcare medical research and medical education is configured. So let's look at what they found. The number of chronic disorders by age group went up as patients got older. So at age 50, 
50% of patients had at least one disease. That's this right here. By age 65, most patients were multi-morbid or have more than one disease. Now let's have a look at multimorbidity by age and socioeconomic status. So here we have age group, and here we have socioeconomic status. So the black line is the most affluent or the most well-to-do group, and the red line is the most deprived patients. We can see with years, we can see there's a disparity in multimorbidity percentage or the number of diseases in the poorer group. So when we look at this particular intersection, at age 50 to 54, in the poorest patients, they had about 37% were multimorbid. But if you follow this line vertically, it's 18% or half as many had multimorbidity in the rich group. And then when we look at the horizontal intersection, when we look at the 26.8% compared to 26.8%, look at the difference here. So at age 45 to 49, in the poor group, 27% were multimorbid. But it took that many more years for this to show up in the other group. So there's a correlation between socioeconomic and health. We know that. And then when we look at patients with mental health disorders and physical health disorders and the correlation between the two, again, most well-to-do, the bottom, and the poorest were at the top. And so when we have a look at the number of physical health disorders and patients with mental health disorders, 11% with the well-to-do group and 24%. And look at the difference in the percentage of mental health disorders. So if you're physically ill and you take this line here, 9.6, you take that line there, it's 24%. And then when we have a look at the number of physical health disorders and correlate that with mental health disorders, 18.1 with the well-to-do group and 34.2 with the poorest group. So there's an association between physical and mental health with a constant social gradient. I know that's complicated because we're looking at socioeconomics, physical health, and mental health. But it's not that surprising, really, because if you think of COVID and what COVID did or, or showed us in the world with the racial disparities. So this is Central Park in New York. And I think this is the Bronx, both in the same city, not very far apart. Rate of death and rate of illness was significantly higher here than if you lived here. And it's all related to the number of people living in your household, the fact that if you live here, you're likely to be able to work from home, you're not taking public transport, you're not an uncontrolled diabetic, you don't have hypertension, you don't smoke, and so on. So the percentage of multimorbidity was higher in older patients versus young or middle-aged patients. We know that. More than 50% of patients with a multimorbidity and more than 66% with a physical or mental disorder were below the age of 65. That was surprising to me. The significant excess multimorbidity in young and middle-aged patients living in the poorest areas. We know that. If we compare poor parts of Egypt, Upper Egypt, for example, to rich parts of Cairo, we know that... that um, life expectancy is going to be lower in a poorer part of, of, this, of the country and the city. And we know that the higher the education of the patient, the more likely they are to seek the best medical care and find the best physicians to take care of them because socioeconomics does not become a factor. Mental disorders were more prevalent in patients with an increasing number of physical disorders. And the doctors that are practicing in deprived areas had a larger percentage of patients with both physical and mental disorders to manage simultaneously versus doctors in more affluent areas. So the problems are just opportunities and workloads. Uvo, do you want me to keep going or do you want me to stop?
Move on. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about complete edentialism and comorbid diseases. This paper was published in 2016. And if you have access to this paper, it's, it's a pretty important one. This looked at complete edentialism and comorbid diseases. And then what they're looking at is obesity in the U.S. So here is the West Coast. This is where I am. California, Washington, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. And these states had significantly higher rates of obesity with Mississippi, Virginia, which are very poor states, have an obesity rate of more than 35%. And what Demarchi found was that you have 3.3x the risk of obesity if you have less than eight natural teeth remaining. Interestingly, these states, West Virginia and Mississippi, also have some of the highest rates of edentialism in the whole of the U.S. I think West Virginia is number one. I'm not entirely certain, but we call this area here the Rust Belt, and that's for another reason. Fully edentulous patients are at risk for malnutrition and obesity versus partially edentulous or fully dentate patients. So it's malnutrition and obesity due to the fact that they struggle to eat or acrylic teeth don't allow them to masticate healthy, hard, crunchy foods. There's, a, there's an association between edentialism and obstructive sleep apnea. So when you become edentulous, there's a change in the orofacial region. You get rotation of the mandible. You're also getting reduction in the vertical and horizontal alveolar ridges. The mandible is rotating up. You get tongue retraction. You get more difficulty breathing. The mouth breathing shortens the distance between the mandible and the hyoid. You get a reduced retroglossal area behind the tongue, net reduction in upper airway space, or obstructive sleep apnea. Risk of obstructive sleep apnea is 2.16 in an edentulous patient versus dentate. Obstructive sleep apnea rates vary. Male to female is 2 to 1. It is somewhat correlated to age, absolutely related to body weight and body mass index. And there's an association between sleep apnea and calcified carotid artery plaques. We know that sleep apnea can cause significant morbidity and mortality with some of these patients. We also know there's a correlation between bacterial infection and atherosclerosis, which can lead to myocardial infarction and stroke. Bacteremia will cause inflammation, autoimmune response, and atherogenic effects. Atherogenic basically means genesis is creation of, atherosclerosis is plaques or, or blockages. There's also a correlation between diabetes mellitus and age and tooth loss. As we get older, we lose more teeth. As we lose more teeth, we're more likely to wear a partial. If we're wearing a partial, we're going to struggle to chew. Tooth loss increased the percentage likelihood of disease. Patients identified as diabetics were more likely to wear partial dentures, 62% versus non-diabetic. And with the edentulous patient, edentulism was 28% in the diabetic population versus 14% in the non-diabetic population. And we know that diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death, or will be in about eight years. Patients with less than 19 teeth had difficulty eating, were at greater risk for cardiovascular disease versus with more than 20 teeth. And you get this chronic systemic infection uh, due to the bacterial infection going straight into the bloodstream. Male patients and non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus had a 30% increased risk for perio, were more likely to be partially edentulous compared to non-diabetic patients. Patients aged more than 80 years old, the risk for mortality from pneumonia was 4x if more than 10 teeth existed with pockets more than 4 millimeters compared to no pockets. How do you think this patient's systemic inflammation looks? 
And what about not removing a prosthesis at night? So this is a patient with an upper partial denture with a tooth. Nocturnal denture wearers had a higher risk of developing aspiration pneumonia. Odds ratio was 2.3. And 10% of deaths from pneumonia in patients in nursing homes with complete dentures may have been prevented with better oral hygiene or by the patient removing their teeth at night. There's also a correlation between edentialism or partial edentialism and dementia. There was a study in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they did post-mortem studies of nuns and they found there was a correlation between Alzheimer's and rates of edentialism. And so no studies confirmed if the correlation between full edentialism and comorbid diseases was casual or causal. This is the very first edentialist patient I treated in the States in 1995. Poorly retained or maintained removal prostheses are associated with pneumonia-related hospitalizations. We know those prostheses can act as a reservoir for bacteria and fungi, which can cause aspiration pneumonia. A reduced non-replaced dentition is associated with an increased risk for mortality. Edentialism is an independent predictor of cardiovascular disease mortality. The risk of decline in cognitive function is greater in fully edentulous patients. And edentulous patients are absolutely at risk for malnutrition and obesity. And they're at risk of COPD-related events. So no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, it's not the same man. My, my experience and your experience may not be the same. The things that I see today, I look at them in a, in a slightly different eye than I did 10, 15 years ago because my thoughts or my ideas have, have progressed with the years. And, and I've become more skeptical about certain things and more open towards others. Let's talk a little bit about the transition to edentialism, and then I'm going to wrap up. So it's important that you understand when you have a patient that presents like this, and these slides are from, are from Finley Sutton, and, it, and you're taking the patient from a state of periodontal collapse and, and occlusal disharmony and so on, into a removable partial denture, you're really just starting the progression. There's still disease here. Some of these teeth aren't gonna be around, but what are the principles that are involved with impression making and how do you help the patient start that transition? Obviously we have to make good primary impressions and good final impressions if you're using a custom tray. You need to be able to mount things appropriately, understand where teeth are going to be. Are you going to maintain diastomas between teeth? You're going to try and close the space because in these instances, you cannot do a wax trying. And how you how you are communicating that information with your technician. So here is the setup. There is the prosthesis and many of us use these types of prostheses. I use acrylic interim removable partial dentures almost on a daily basis. There is the prosthesis after it's been delivered, the diastema. And there is the patient before and after. So this is just a step along the way. This patient is likely to either lose more teeth or transition towards a full denture at some point. So the edentulous predicament, and those of you who don't know, this is George Washington. Here he is with his famous wooden dentures. The edentulous predicament, we all have a mental picture of the ideal patient with good ridges and ideal muscle attachments, leading to a predictable outcome. What about unpredictable treatment outcomes, what we call the maladaptive patient, high expectation, no prior denture experience, severe resorption, dry mouth, and high muscle attachments? We must counsel our patients to lower their expectations and raise awareness of objective versus subjective treatment. What's the difference between a possible versus a probable outcome, and how does the patient psyche play into that? So when you look at the maxillary arch, Looking at many, many different things. Typically, this is your primary stress bearing area. This is a good arch form to tolerate a maxillary complete denture as long as the patient doesn't have a hyper, hypersensitive gag reflex. So we're looking at the denture mucosa, attached versus non-attached, the amount of cretinization, the bone contours, the ridge height, the presence of tori or exotoses, the hard palate form. Is it tall and narrow or broad and wide? the tuberosity form, 
The muscle attachments, are they normal or are they low? The frenal attachments, the hamula notch over here, the soft palate form, and in the mandible, it can be a different story. It often is. Again, looking at attached versus non-attached mucosa, the amount of craconization, you can see this patient's got bilateral denture sores. Again, ridge height and contour, presence of tori and exostoses, the ridge consistency, the frenal attachments, the floor of the mouth of the mylohyoid, are you able to lock in in the retromylohyoid fossa? The mentalis muscle and masseter, how they're going to impact your prosthesis. The tongue size and posture. Do you have a retruded tongue position? What's buxinator doing for you? How much retromyoid space does the patient have? And you're going to be able to engage that. Are you able to, to capture the retromolar pad and use that as one of your landmarks? And we know that a technically sound prosthesis relies on a well-formed mandibular ridge, absolutely an accurate central relation record. Those are positive indicators for success. A neurotic patient with a poor mandibular ridge, high, high rate of failure. A minority of patients may never adapt to a complete denture. And so when you have a patient who's prognathic, these are porcelain teeth. This is my first denture patient when I came to Michigan. We can see the ridge relationship, and I've set her up in a crossbite with monoplane teeth to allow her to slide around. And I know that the mandibular prosthesis is going to be poor. If, if anything, this, this prosthesis is going to be mostly retained by the polished surface and the interaction of the buccinator muscle and the tongue, because the fitting surface has very poor retention due to the fact that there's ridge. And we've got to remember that we're often working, or we have to work at the neutral zone. The neutral zone is the area where the outward forces of the tongue are neutralized by the inward forces of the cheeks and the lips. If you put teeth significantly outside the neutral zone, the patients are either going to be biting their cheek, biting their tongue, biting their lip, and rejecting the prosthesis. And so look at the dislocating versus fixing muscles on a lower complete denture, Dislocating muscles are the master, posteriorly, mentalis anteriorly, incisivus labia inferioris. Lingually, you've got the medial pterygoid, the palatoglossus, styloglossus, and mylohyoid. And your fixing muscles are the buccinator and the orbicularis oris, which intersects here at the modulus. Lingually, all of these muscles are in the tongue. Genioglossus is attaching the genial tubercles to the tongue. And then the lingual longitudinal, lingual transverse, and lingual vertical, that is the tongue proper. And so you need to have an appropriate occlusal surface. Nowadays, I would not put a second molar on here, where you have occlusal harmony and function. The polished surface is absolutely critical to allow the, the muscles to contract and maintain the denture in position. And the fitting surface is an accurate representation the intraoral situation at rest and in function to try and prevent air ingress and not cause ulceration. Centric relation of vertical dimension, that's a whole other animal. This is a patient's uh, pre-op position. We can see we've had significant wear and a mal relationship. You need to be able to open the vertical dimension or restore the vertical dimension of occlusion, record it appropriately, and your dentures should harmonize with the patient's swallowing reflexes since the mandible is at or near CR when the patient swallows. The factors that can influence CR records, you can see this is a class two patient. The patient health and cooperation, TMJ is an associated neuromuscular system. Patient posture and position, are they supine or are they sitting up? The relationship of the maxilla to the mandible, skeletally. The tissue resiliency, the alveolar ridge size and shape, the amount and character of saliva, the tongue size and the position, and all of the above, or all of the coming. Your level of skill, the record-based comfort and stability, the technique you're using, the amount of pressure applied, the recording material accuracy, 
you articulate a selection and usage, the record itself and how you verified it, and the interpretation of the record. So this is study has something to do with the patient satisfaction with new dentures, and they found that absolutely the most important thing was the accuracy of jaw relations was the key variable. Your CR record is, is paramount in terms of success or failure of the prosthesis. And as we transition into more complex treatment, you still need to apply your basic routine prosthodontic principles before you get into these types of complications. Because if you don't know complete denture prosthetics, how are you going to transition to fix hybrid prosthesis? Emotionally, we know that patients suffer when they lose teeth. And that being a dentulist meets the WHO criteria for physical impairment, disability and handicapped. And patients can be socially inhibited, lower self-esteem, they enjoy eating less, they age prematurely, and those effects are magnified with ill-fitting dentures. Here is Helen with an upper complete denture and a lower hybrid, different person. And again, this demonstrates the relationship of the maxilla to the mandible and what you're able to accomplish with acrylic flanges to support the upper lip and the lower lip compared to an edentulous patient and the vertical dimension of occlusion. Patients go through a grief process when they lose their teeth. Bereavement for lost teeth, for lost anything, goes through the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and if you're lucky, they're going to get to acceptance. But a well-fabricated maxillary complete denture can really duplicate the patient's appearance from a prior or earlier period in their life. I think I'm going to call it there, Uva. We can, we, the next lecture will start at this point. Okay. All right. I'm happy to answer questions. So you say you're going to do uh, the art of denture, complete denture publication in the next lecture? Yeah, so we're going to start there. Um, there's plenty more. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, I, I mean, so all the groups, uh, you guys, are, you, you, we need to go back to this lecture. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, references. I, I need some groups. You need to find out, you know, you, I, I think Dr. Brashi did, you know, did indicate what those references are. I need, uh, we need to get all the articles together uh, so that we can study them. But I'm going to go back. There's some questions here. Um, so there's a first question on the chat. It says, um, if the mandible uh, is, uh, has a lot of resorption, how do you, you know, make, uh, you know, place implants without fracture? Okay, so uh, that's no, a good I, question. I'm able to do that if there's a lot of resorption. What, what, in terms of, do you have any numbers in terms of? Uh, yes, so let's look at a case. I think, I think that's the smart thing to do. If you look at this slide here, when you are planning a case like this and you have six millimeters of bone, this is a poor candidate for an implant. Typically for us, Uva, we want at least 10 millimeters of anterior mandibular height. Mm -hmm. The shortest implant we're placing for a fixed hybrid is seven millimeters. But the issue here is not always just the bone, it's also the floor of the mouth tissues and the amount of, of, of mucosa and so on that you have. So I think you've got to be very careful in the anterior mandible, because even though this is type one or type two bone, it's brittle. And remember the number of osteotomies, the more holes you drill, the weaker that mandible is going to be. So I think if you have a patient with 10 millimeters of anterior mandible, and it's one or type two bone, you can potentially safely place two eight millimeter implants and we know that there's a school of thought where you go for bicortical anchorage and you go through the superior cortex and you're emerging on the, on the inferior border of the mandible. But if you're doing these types of cases, you've really got to be able to deal with post-op complications such as a limbal perforation. So remember that there are, there are vessels in the anterior mandible and it's not always about the bone per se. What you don't want to run into is a bleed. And if you have a significant bleed, that could threaten the patient's airway and cause death. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's published. Um, you also have a number of anastomoses of the vessels and the nerves 
anterior to the mental foramen. I'm trying to pull up a slide, hold on. So I would say 10 millimeters. Um, let me show you this case. Can you still see my screen? Yes. So when you look at this slide, this is a patient with a maxillary complete denture. They're not sticking their tongue out. Implants have been placed in the anterior mandible. There's been a lingual perforation. The patient has started to develop Ludwig's angina and they've been intubated in the hospital. So there's been a perforation of the lingual cortex and damage to the sublingual artery. Here is the airway after it's been intubated. And there's one of the blood clots. So the problem is the lingual concavity in the anterior mandible. You know that the mandible is not straight up and down. You will often have, you're going to have to tilt your implants either facially or lingually according to the result of the anterior mandible. So if we go back all the way to earlier, what will happen as your mandible is resorbing, it's resorbing forward, it's becoming more anterior, and it's leaning back. So you end up with the anterior mandible leaning towards the lingual, which becomes very challenging. Because if you place your implant straight up and down, you're going to perf. So you really need to have a very good idea of implant positioning. You need to flap these cases. You've got to be careful about doing everything flaplessly because if you do it flaplessly and you have a, um, a bleed, it's going to be very tough to manage. Again, you know, I'm answering something that is not really my area of expertise, but I've seen enough to be dangerous. Um, and what you're looking at specifically is in a sagittal slice, let's look at Ida. So this is a fairly routine one, isn't it? Because you can go vertically straight up and down. The problem is the mental foramen and the anterior extension, right? Does that answer the question? Yes, yes, I, I believe so, yes. Um. So, so it, 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 what, what of, uh, I mean, so this is at implant, um, implant level, right, at the bone. So what of um, amount of keratinized gingiva? Oh, that's a that great way. question. So let's talk a little bit about what keratinized mucosa does for you. And what, are, what are the pros and cons of keratinized mucosa versus non-keratinized mucosa? And what type of prosthesis do you have? So there's not conclusive research to show that implant failure rates are higher with non-keratinized mucosa. But the benefit of having keratinized tissue is it's more resistant to inflammation. And if you have a frenum pull and non-keratinized mucosa, that's going to affect, look at this patient, the guy with the poor dexterity. Once you have exposure of the implant and threads exposed here, then you've got a problem. So if you can have keratinized mucosa and your implant is emerging through the tissue appropriately, that's going to give you a little bit more protection from peri-implant inflammation. And remember, all of this is based upon inflammation. So if we look at healthy tissues, what they should look like, So this is a case that was done by somebody else. What don't we like about this? Look at the positioning of the implants relative to the mucosa. All of these are lingual, aren't they? Look how inflamed this is. So you want to have a ring of peri-implant. So it looks okay here, but look at the amount of inflammation on the lingual because the implant is too lingually positioned. So your implant should be emerging more or less in an ideal position. And if it does, you've got a chance of the tissues looking like this. So here are four implants placed by my partner. That's what it should look like. You can see you've got 360 degree peri-implant keratinized mucosa, right? Yes. Ideal positioning and ideal emergence. If you have that, you're really not going to have a whole lot of peri-implant inflammation. Okay? Yes.
Nice. Okay. Thank you. Um, there, there's another question here. I think, you know, he seems to say you've gotten, given the answer, but he was talking about that you're, you don't seem to be in a hurry uh, to extract all the teeth, even though the patient is moving towards uh, total, uh, you know, identitism. Well, so there's typically three types of patients. There's patients that absolutely say, I do not want a removable prosthesis. They know right in the beginning. No way am I ever going to wear something removable. It's not acceptable. I'm a high class patient and so on and so forth. All of that. Then there are the patients who really don't know that they're, 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 they don't know what they don't know. And then you've got a third category that's philosophical. So when we think of the house classification of prosthodontic patients, we've got the exacting patient, the demanding, engineer, precise patient. And I can deal with those patients because they typically know what they want. And by the same token, they know what they don't want. Then you've got the indifferent patient, the people who don't care. And they're difficult because you're trying to gauge what they can mentally cope with. Then you've got the hysterical or the narcissistic patient. They're definitely people that you've got to be careful whatever treatment you provide because they're always going to find problems with it. And then you have the philosophical patient who can come and go and say, yeah, maybe it, it's so, it depends on the personality of the patient. And I know that sounds uh, non-scientific, but you, you're doing a certain amount of psychological analysis of patient expectation and, and how can this patient tolerate and, and move forward towards treatment. So no, I'm not always in a huge rush to move a patient into a maxillary complete denture because that's an irrevocable step. It, once you've done it, you've done it. There's no going back. And even when you do do it, you've got no guarantee that they're going to adapt well to it. So if I have a patient who's had an interim partial denture for a number of years and they've tolerated it fairly well and they're a philosophical patient, then I'm that patient is a good candidate or transitioning towards a maxillary complete denture or mandibular complete denture. So that there's a subjective portion of edentulous treatment. And that's what makes it frustrating. And that's what makes it fun. And that's why you have to get to know the patient and understand what their expectations are. All right. Right. Thank you. So, so for a patient who is, um, you know, not a good candidate for, for um, implants because of the, you know, amount of resorption that has taken place, what, what, what would you, um, what is the, uh, what is the, what would you? Are we talking about maxilla or mandible? Mandible. Good question. So if a patient is not a candidate for, because of the amount of advanced resorption. So let's imagine we have a patient who, the, the, the issue is this, Uva, if they've, if they've worn a complete denture for a long time, and many of them have, they've gotten to the point where they can't tolerate it. So this patient did not become this atrophic overnight. She's been in a denture for years. So the question is, why wasn't something done before? Because by the time they get to this point in their 90s, how are you going to fabricate any kind of removal of prosthesis? Because think of your denture foundation. So at this point, this is almost an untreatable patient without an onlay graft. But this patient didn't lose this bone from Tuesday till today. So what you want to do is you want to place implants for an overdenture while the patient still has some bone in the anterior mandible. And when you have a look at what Jocelyn Fine and Mark Thomason and that group from McGill, they, they published something, a consensus from 2002 that said a mandibular overdenture is the standard of care. So you, you have plenty of opportunity along the way. You just need to figure out when you're going to do the treatment. Because the other thing that you don't know is how long is the patient going to live? Let's look at this patient. Very demanding patient. He had these three implants placed by a former student of mine. Look how lingual the implants are. Patient couldn't tolerate anything removable. We had to remove these implants. And we placed four implants. Patient was still very unhappy because of the position of the implants 
relative to the prosthesis. This guy was a very, very demanding patient. I made him three maxillary complete dentures. Not one, not two, but three. So when you have a patient that's that demanding, it more or less doesn't matter what you're going to do. It's going to be a problem. So in terms of bone, treat while you can, because once you get four millimeters or six millimeters of anterior mandible, forget it. And it sounds strange. You're better off hanging on to old teeth, like canines and laterals and so on, and having a Kennedy class one partial, then you're having a patient edentulous. If a patient is financially incapable, and we know in the Middle East, lots of patients cannot afford complex treatment, go to old treatment, do endo on the canines, decoronate the canines and put an attachment on the canine, or do an amalgam on the canine as a root after it's had endo, because now you have stability and support, right? And you've maintained the bone. Does that answer it? Yes, yes, it does. Um, and, and the la well, there's a last question here I, I do. He says, is there any source you may suggest in terms of the journal for, for us, I guess any scientific um, journal for, you know, that presents cases as uh, like you've just done? Is there anywhere they can have access? You know, I think what you do is you go back to the classic books. So there's a, there's a really good book by Boucher on complete edentialism. McCracken is a really good book on edentialism. Stewart as a partial edentialism or RPDs. So the old books tend to be the best resource because you can buy that classic book. And it's, it's, I mean, that's, I still have the books that my dad gave me 20 years ago and I still read them because it, it, it has all the classic literature and all the steps that you need to understand journals there's no dedicated journal to edentialism per se there's the journal of geriatrics and so on but it, it's it they're tough because edentialism is one of those things the more you do the more you understand and the critical part is clinically you can only do so much but if your lab doesn't understand what you're doing or what you're trying to accomplish it becomes challenging and one of the reasons that i i enjoy where i practice is because i have two lab technicians but I work with day in, day out, and we go and I look at the setup and say, hey, you've set it up as a class one, it's a class two. So it, it's, it's a tough one. I know, I know. Anyway, thank, thank you so much. Uh, this is, uh, this, this is going to keep us, uh, <laughs> this lecture is going to keep us busy for, because each slide is loaded. And guys, uh, you know, we're going to go through um, the material and let's, let's get all the references out and, um, and uh, you know, kind of, Understand. I, I think this is this is the first thing we need to know in terms of before we start jumping into cases, uh, knowing the type of patient. I mean, it makes a lot of sense for you to think, you know, to just look at your patient. I know we want to place implants, but not everybody is a candidate for implant placement. You have to look at the agreed uh, history and every other thing uh, together. But thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so we are back in, in a couple in a couple of days, uh, like you know, on the sixteenth for another lecture, and uh, looking forward to having everybody on there. Uh, we have a lot of people from, from Iraq. <laughs> I said, you know, Iraq has become uh, a major focus right now. Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world, to register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 